Join us for a visit to Three Sisters Island coming up next. Welcome to today's episode of Feasting on Fiction. I'm here today with Val and Heidi to discuss one of Nora Roberts' trilogies. So let's just dive right in. Hello. Tonight we're talking about Nora Roberts and the Three Sisters Island trilogy specifically. So we're going to start with the sort of easy and obvious question. Why Nora Roberts? Why this trilogy? What do you enjoy? Well, I, I love reading Nora Roberts you know, as a whole. And I, I'm loving the fact that she, she's gone into this paranormal stint she takes it to a paranormal level. She she keeps it back and keeps it with her traditional you know, story one, person one. There's always three women that get with three men. And sometimes there's a mystery, sometimes there isn't. But it, it always wraps up in the end with the feel-good story. So that's why I like reading her. I agree. Um, Nora Roberts is kind of like comfort food. You know, you have an idea, but you're not quite sure how you're going to get to that happy ending at the end. I do like this particular series for the paranormal bent in that it's not, it's not really out of the realm. Like, it, it's set on this island that was created for this purpose of safe haven, the small town community feel. It makes you want to hop on a plane or a boat and, like, go out there and, like, become a, you know, resident of Three Sisters Island. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. Especially, like, on the comfort thing, I found that during our crazy world time, I have a whole stack of books. Thank you to the Waterford Library for suspending late fees and just telling everyone to keep everything. But I've really had a hard time getting into new ones. If you go to my Goodreads profile, it's like 12 Nora Roberts in a row because it is. It's like that comfort. Like I can just, it's an old pair of slippers, right? You can just kind of settle right in. You know, basically what you're going to get. You know, there's not going to be any like crazy surprises that make you want to throw the book across the room. You don't have to think a whole lot. Like you just can read and enjoy and, and let it go. I do really like her paranormal ones. Those are the ones that I go back to over and over again. And I totally feel you about the small town thing. She not only writes a small town that I want to go live in, but I want to go open a bookstore. Like I could totally do that, right? Yes, exactly. It's got that, her books are whimsical enough that you can suspend reality, but they've got key points of realism in there that make you think that it could actually happen. Yeah, it does. It makes you want to like get on a plane, go find this island. And, and live in a small town where there's the worst crime is the dog that rolls in fish guts. And, you know, and then maybe, maybe there's, you know, evil as well, but it always, you know, you always win in the end. So I do love that this island needs two police people. And it really is. It's like, oh, they really had to lay down the law with those guys that were poaching the lobsters out of the trap. Like, and the, and the Budweiser cooler. Yeah. <laughs> And it always, it always is like, well, I let him go because this person didn't want to do this person, this thing. And yes. I'll, I'll have to cut where I just accidentally almost said do this person. Although there is a lot, there's plenty of that in these stories yeah, plenty, as well. I find myself when I read the book the first time, I'm like absorbed in every moment of every scene. But then when I reread them, I like skip the naughty bits. Yes. And I get, I go, I go to the books, that, the bits that make me happy. And that's the thing too, I think with like, the time that we're in literally right now with this pandemic and staying at home and not really being able to concentrate the reread, the second read, you know, the kids are coming in, you can put it down, you know exactly where you're going to pick back up. You can skip over the parts you don't like. We're just talking, I don't want all of the naughty bits. Like, it's great one time through, but I don't need it three or four times through. Never turn on, but, mm. The other thing with Nora Roberts, too, in this small town, she also does an amazing job of, like, the one or two secondary characters in this particular series lulu yeah mm -hmm. she's not a true like main main character but she's a really close secondary character that has such a strong personality like that she may be the one that sticks out to a reader beyond mia and nell and and ripley right yeah, for sure. She does. She has her stable of 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 quirky personalities that always get in there, and they're always so much fun. Um, and yeah, I love. Uh, we get some of like, and I'm blanking on his name. I think it's Dennis, but like Ripley's young cousin that's getting yeah. into trouble all over the place, and you know, does. Just... But it's never, it's never bad. Like it's never bad trouble, right? He's skipping class, and he's got caught climbing in the window by his aunt. <laughs> the same one that set the firecrackers off that Zach caught, and he had to do the hard labor of cleaning. Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah, eight dollars an hour. 
<laughs> I adore because you you know they they're so timeless until she gets into that like nitty gritty mm-hmm. where she'll mention a, a a wage or she'll mention you know she'll mention like a, a what would have been like a pop culture reference but it's not yeah necessarily pop culture anymore. Um, Amazon has to set up a fax machine and right. a phone line, and in the beginning Nell didn't have a phone. Yes. And it's so funny because I read, I've read books where they overdo all those references. Like I remember reading one and just writing, and it wasn't Nora Roberts, but I just remember writing a review that like, if someone tries to read this in 10 years, they're not going to understand all of these references. And I don't, she doesn't run into that problem because we all, it's all things that people will remember, but it is always funny to be like, oh, that's when this was written that so-and-so was popular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yeah, it occasionally, but you can you can forget in between those because she's timeless. Like a lot mm-hmm. of people are so timeless, and like I'll be like, oh, facsimile. Okay, <laughs> exactly. You know, the book where the main char- female character puts on pantyhose. Mm-hmm. Yes. And like, you know, sometimes I have the opposite. I was reading um, one of one of Nora Roberts' slightly newer trilogies, and I think she references uh, it's an Adele song, and I went the other way. I went. That song is that old that it's in this book, really? And it's and it was just a reminder to me that okay, well, Adele has been around longer than in my brain it seems like. The last year, uh, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the stereotypical. Like, I'm not getting older. How's everything else? Exactly. How's time passing? And that's I mean, that's what her books are. Her books are completely timeless. I mean, Since this is a podcast about food in fiction, I've I found it as I read Nora Roberts, I found it very interesting how often she uses food in her books because I mean this this trilogy in particular because obviously there's a cafe and Nell runs a cafe and catering and so that's sort of the mechanism why we get it. But in all of her books, you'll find you know, there's usually one of the main characters in the trilogy loves to cook and will get like pretty detailed explanations about the recipe they're making that night. My brain goes to why? Like why do you think she does that? Because it doesn't detract from the story, but it doesn't necessarily move the story along either. So I'm I'm curious why you think that she focuses on food in places. You know, when, when you brought this up, like I didn't notice it. And so you brought it up and I'm like, oh my God, she does. Because I, then I started rolling into the other books that I've read, you know, like especially like the Chesapeake Bay book where Anna cooks and people, everything happens around the kitchen table. And I, and I thought, you know, I'm I'm not real up on like I because is she Irish because she does a lot with the Ireland. But yeah, right. There's a lot of Ireland. But that's there, there's a places. lot there around like family and food and food means comfort as we all know we comfort ourselves with food and and family and gatherings and so I'm wondering if that's part of the reason why we are so drawn to her books because we have been brought up family dinners and family holiday dinners and and things happen at the dinner table and we're drawn to books that maybe have that element in it. I agree completely. And the same thing, like I, in the periphery, like I had noticed it, you know, before in reading her books, but not until you really were like, okay, this is what we're going to talk about. That I really paid attention, especially in this book and some of the others Food is that family time, that time together. But in this book, they use that as a time to come together to figure out plans. We're going to have a meal together. We're going to sit down and reunite as a circle. And when, the more I got into it, the more I realized. When you, mm-hmm. and, and again, the circle of, as it grew, them all sitting around a table, eating together and celebrating their time together. Even the funny things about like the guys and stealing the lot you know food is a way of life for a lot of people on this island they sell their food and the fish to the tourists and probably to other places as well um that kept coming back when i was rereading this one and i agree she always has something with food in there you know, yeah I, well i was i was going to agree with both of you that i think that that's such a big thing and it's and that these are all unre- at least somewhat unrelated. There's often sibling groupings or cousins or things like that, but it's this extended group that is becoming a family Yeah. for some reason. In the paranormal books, it's usually to defeat an evil entity or she's big on quests. They're, they're yeah. looking for something, but it is. It's that time when they're, they're sort of bonding, they're settling in, they're making plans. Sometimes they're arguing and, and making up over food. 
Um, and so it does feel like it's just this extension of how we as people use food for all sorts of reasons. I've also noticed her earlier trilogies mention food, but not in the detail that her newer ones do. I was thinking too, you know, how easy it is to slip back into her books and how comfortable they are. Food is multisensory. So even when you write about it or you see a picture of it, you can smell it mm -hmm. or add it, you can taste it. And so I'm wondering if but that's also the draw of of her books, her more or her books, her more recent books, you know, because like back in the very beginning, her books read a lot more like Harlequin, mm -hmm. the, Irish, the Irish Thurb, like that stuff. But as she's developed as a writer, her books have gotten longer, her plots have gotten more complicated, but they've also gotten more comfortable and easy to read. But that brings in almost that multi-sensory piece where you're she's describing the food in such detail and you're like, oh my God, that smells so good. Right. You know? And it just keeps you there. And I'm wondering if that's part of part of her style and part of the reason why we keep coming back. In the first book, when Nell is making the muffins and Zach has come over, he's been up all night and he's like, Oh, I don't think those are quite right. Like you can just imagine him like juggling a hot muffin and taking a bite, being like, Oh no, this is okay. Or in the last book where Sam is actually courting Mia through the food. Mm -hmm. like, favorite wine he gets Nell to make the food you know and he's kind of recreating what they never I mean they maybe did but never really did as kids it's that sensory that you can imagine them sitting on a picnic blanket with the, you know maybe it's cool and the trees are rustling it truly sensory is a great word for that yeah absolutely and it just and it just makes that connection because we can all now remember a time when we were on a picnic not necessarily with a hot guy feeding us but Maybe, maybe. But she does. Okay, so she she writes these things in a way where you know it's not realistic, but you don't ever close the book and go yeah. and look around at your life and go, "Oh my god, my life sucks." You don't like. Right. You want to keep going. You want the best for them. Like, I feel heartbroken at the end of the day. Send them a Christmas card, right? Yeah. I'm like, all right. Nora Roberts, food. Final thoughts. What what is our what is our takeaway? I love that she that she does it right now that I've noticed it. I'm interested to see how how much more I notice it when I'm reading again because it does. I think it brings in the multi sensory experience. It brings in that circle of three, the the friends becoming family, kind of that whimsical non reality reality that that's why you know that we like to escape into, which is why we like to read books. I agree. Non-reality reality is a great point because like we just talked about, sometimes the books are so out of this realm, like, you know, the small business center can live on a mansion by the sea, you know, and sell only a hundred books and they're fine. But we all have to sit down. We all have to eat at some point. It's that common denominator that links this alternate reality with real life and makes it kind of blends those two worlds together. All right. Well, I'm going to thank you guys very much for chatting with me. And I'm going to thank everyone for listening. Until next time, keep on feasting. Thanks for listening and for supporting Feasting on Fiction. All the opinions of the panel are ours alone, and we're not associated with the media we're discussing in any way. If you'd like to support us, please head over to cookingthebook.com. Check out our Patreon and all of our social media. Thanks.